Automating AI can be incredibly beneficial, but it can get pretty expensive, with APIs for Gemini, OpenAI, and Claude getting pretty expensive the more you use them. But that's where Alama comes in to help you use open source models on your own machine, helping you avoid all these API costs but be able to still do automation. Let's have a look. Now, if you're not familiar, Alama is effectively like a package manager for large language models. As you can see here, it runs a bunch of the popular ones you might have heard of before, such as DeepSeaCar1, Llama3, and Gemma3. So here I can just have a look. Uh, Gemma3 is one I quite like to use because it's quite small, specifically the 1 billion model here. It's quite quick to download. But all I have to do to run this is I can just copy this Alama run command, assuming I've already got Alama downloaded which you can easily do with this download button and we've got a dedicated video on setting up a llama if you want to do that and then if I go to my terminal which I have here and just put a llama run and I'm just going to add the tag uh, 1 billion because I already have that downloaded I'm able to now just ask it questions for example what is the fastest type of database and I can ask it questions just like you would ask something like ChatGPT, Claude, or Gemini. So as you can see here, this is running entirely locally on my machine without me having to deal with an, you know, a third party tool, which might have a subscription in front of it. It might have API costs, but this is obviously limited by the performance of your machine. So smaller models will run faster, but they'll be less accurate. As you can see, there are some larger models here. As you can see here in the GitHub readme, we can see here that they recommend having at least eight gigabytes of RAM available to run 7 billion uh, models. Uh, that's the parameters. So for example, I could run this deep sea car one model, but this one here that's got 671 models, I would need some some sort of server to do that. So do bear that in mind when downloading models because it potentially could cause problems for you. Now, it's cool that you can download these models and interact with them for a text interface. We've also shown that you can connect them to web interfaces to make them feel a little bit better, more user-friendly, improve the experience. But how do you automate these, right? How do you take these large language models a step further? Because with something like Python, right, you can easily make API calls to OpenAI, Claude, Gemini, and, you know, automate it that way. But how can I automate Alama? Now, Kestra just recently released an Alama plugin. So now you can build your workflows in Kestra that use Alama. And so here's a few examples, and I can actually show you what those look like. Here's an example where you can use an input here to provide it a prompt and then it will run that prompt. So this is, and then it will output it into a text file. So this could be useful if you want to be able to send the text file to a certain place, maybe into Slack or maybe to a file server. And so here, if I say, tell me a joke about AI, I can press execute and it's now going to run that model um, download the model and run it inside of this workflow. So which is pretty useful. So we can see that took about one minute 14. If I go to outputs here, I can actually see the response. The prompt we gave it was tell me a joke and here it's given me a joke. So very useful. I can now take this file, send it somewhere else, take the content from it, send it as a message, do whatever I like with it. Pretty handy. But it took a minute and 14 seconds to ask that simple question. And you may be wondering, that's not great. Why did it take so long? Well, that's because it had to download the model first, but there are a few things you can do to get around this if you're running this workflow regularly. So what we can do is there's a few properties we can have a look at here. So let me just click onto here. So the first property that we have available is enable model caching. Now this is set to true. So now the model is downloaded. We can now just continue to use that. But one of the ones I really like is uh, being able to do, let me just exit out of here is uh, I already have a bunch of models on my local machine. Now I'm running Kestra inside of Docker, but that doesn't matter. We can get around that by modifying our configuration so that we can use it. So what this will do is the enable property here will use a Docker volume to be able to store those models so that between runs, it can just reference them and it doesn't have to download them again, especially because some of those models, as we've seen, some of these models are pretty large. As you can see, three gigabytes, you don't want to download that every single run. So if you can cache this, that's definitely worth doing. So to have this work, we'll need to have a Docker volume and we'll also be able to use the model cache path to be able to point to some of those models that on my local machine. So before we uh, show that off, let's now add to our configuration um, 
the Docker volume configuration we need to be able to store these models somewhere. So here I've got my um, Kestra configuration. Here is Kestra, I'm just gonna turn that off now. And then all I'm gonna do is add in under my Kestra configuration block here, I'm gonna add a new thing called plugin then configurations, I'll make that a little bit bigger. And what we're doing here is because the Alama plugin is running inside of a Docker container, it's pulling an Alama image from Docker Hub and using that, we're gonna modify the Docker task runner here to then use volume enabled equals true. So this will allow it to then store data between runs in a volume. So once that's saved and we can do that like so, I can now then type Docker compose up. Excellent, so Kestra is just back up and running. I can now refresh this page and we can now get to work with setting up our caching. So first things first is adding that enable caching model property to true. And then what we're gonna do is also uh, put the model caching path and set that to, now Alama is stored as a dot file on the dot Alama under your user. So for me on a Mac, that would be slash u, that would be users slash w Russell slash dot Alama. So that's where it can access the models I already have. As we've already seen, Alama supports a number of different commands. So we can add models, download models, delete them, we'll just list them. So here I can list them, but using that model caching will allow me to see those models that are already pre-installed on my machine. So if I execute this workflow once I've pressed save, and then uh, we'll see that it one won't take very long to run because it's already got the Docker image cached and the models there. And we can see here under the info, we've got a bunch of different models, which does actually match if I do a llama list on my machine. This also matches what we can see here. So all good and uh, you know what we wanna see. So if I wanted to use, um, let's say llama two, seven billion, I could do that too. But we're gonna have a look at another example first before we make the models large. Now, I've showed you how you can automate a llama so you can use these large language models, but what about an actual use case where you might actually want to run this in a workflow because so far everything I've done is just stuff you can do in the terminal. Nothing relies on actual automation. Well, what about this workflow, which if we have a look at this topology view, what we're gonna do here is uh, summarize weekly commits from a repository. So we've got a trigger here that's gonna run this once a week. And then what we're gonna do is clone a repository of our choice. I'm gonna use the Kestra Blueprints repository. Then we can fetch the commits using a shell command. So here we're just you know, running some shell commands here, nothing too crazy. And then once we've done that, we'll get a nice TXT file full of all the commits and the commit messages. Then what we'll do is we can then use a llama here to summarize those commits. And in fact, I've given it a pretty disgusting prompt here because I've put it all as one line, but feel free to do this however you like. I've told it to use Gemma 3 1 billion because we've one, got it already downloaded, but two, it's quite a quick model to run. So the issue with some of the larger models is even if you have them downloaded, they require a lot of computation and I don't have that right now on my laptop. So we're gonna use a smaller model right now for this example. And what I've done is asked it to summarize the following Git commits into a clear and concise weekly development update for users. Output plain text for Slack, no markdown or extra formatting, ensure no markdown syntax like bold text in the response. Stick to plain text. Here are the commit messages and I've got an output put in here that's gonna read that text file. And then I've told it to output that response to this output.txt file. Now, if we scroll down, that uh, follows with a Slack message. It's gonna take that file and then send it the, the content of it to Slack so we can see what's going on. So let's execute this workflow now. And we're gonna be able to hopefully get a nice summary of our commit. So it's got to clone that repository. This apology view would be a good one for this. It's got to clone the repository. It's got to fetch those commits. And then it's got to summarize them. But because we've already used Alarma here um, with that model, in theory, shouldn't take too long because we've already got it. It's just, we're gonna have to wait for the model to actually process the response we've given to it and figure out what it wants. So that only took 15 seconds. Now, if I go over to our um, summarized commits here, we can actually see 
it did summarize it, it's kind of given it as an email. So that's the other issue of AI used to smaller models, they don't always listen to you. So again, that's where Alarm is lovely because you can pick a model, whatever you like. I'm not the biggest fan of Gemma 3, but it's good for these examples because it's quite small and quick, but you might find that maybe Llama 2 or Llama 4 uh, are better options, but Llama 4 is pretty big, so do bear that in mind. Now, I did ask it to send it as a Slack message, so I will dig that up now so we can see what that looks like. So. Let's have a quick look. And uh, here is our Slack message. So here it sent it to us as a message. It actually got a little bit of formatting unintentionally. Again, it didn't fully listen to us, but again, that's down to the model we've chosen to use here, but it did automate it. So now I can get a weekly update to understand main changes that have happened inside of um, this repository. Maybe you've got a bunch of different repositories that you'd want to automate. And I've done this all without actually needing to um, use any API tokens, have to pay any APIs. And if we ever looked, that workflow took what, a total of 22 seconds to run. Not bad going really from a computation perspective. So um, definitely something to consider if you're looking to automate using large language models, but you wanna keep costs to a minimum. Another consideration as well might be that you're working with sensitive data and you don't wanna feed data into large language models that you don't have control of. Maybe you don't want your data going to OpenAI or Claude or Gemini. And in that sense, what you're gonna do is using an open source model where you're running it locally and you can shut off its network access could be a good option. So. Yeah, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear how you're automating AI, um, how you're using Kestra to automate AI. And uh, yeah, let us know what other AI related plugins and tools you would love to see in Kestra in the future.